song tonight, and I don't see people acting like, well, you know, I wish something like that would happen, amen. They're smiling on everybody's faces. Why? Because we're, oh. we're in the middle of it right now. I appreciate that, amen. That's a blessing, y'all. This, this, this isn't something you sing about because it's just something to get excited about. It's something to get excited about, but we sing it now. Why? Because it's part of what we're experiencing, amen. Now, where does revival come from? It comes from the pastor. No, 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 no. Don't make that mistake. That comes from God, amen. amen. That comes from God. And i tell you what he's done. He's opened up the, the vial of revival, and he's pouring it on Elizabethtown, Kentucky, because I believe he is honestly, as Brother Joe Osborne has said before, I believe God's honored and pleased with how we're worshiping here in Elizabethtown, amen. And let's keep it that way, amen. Brother Bernard, we open our service, brother, in a word of prayer. Amen. Thank you, Father. Father, we thank you for your blessings on us again tonight. Father, we pray you come down and meet with us, Lord, to teach us some things yes, Father, that Jesus. we need to know, Father, that we can be better soldiers, be better Christians, be better members of society to prove that, that Christ is the way. Father, we thank you for everything you've given us, and we ask in your blessed name, Jesus, tonight. Amen. Amen. You may be seated. Well, good evening, everybody. I'm just excited about... What God is doing here as well, I don't know if you all got the count last, last Sunday. And listen, I don't sit here and count the heads. There's, there's too much going on in my mind and my heart to do that. However, uh, sometimes Brother Chuck Willis, he gets excited about there. He, he just he likes to reach out and count. We're not playing the numbers game here, but I do like to express to you all, for those of you that are looking around going, I wonder how many people are here, amen. We had 140 on Sunday morning. Isn't that a blessing? And I know for a fact we have people that weren't saved. I'll tell you how, how packed it was outside. If you haven't seen the pictures of the parking lot, I've got a few of those. I know of two people specifically from members of the church that said so-and-so was supposed to come, but they got to the parking lot, they had nowhere to park, so they went home. That's how, that's how packed it was outside. So that's, uh, what's that? That's what we need. We need another parking yard. I told him, I said, just park in the neighbor's parking, parking spots. Up. Just park next door. That'll really get the neighbor's attention. Amen. What are people parking in my yard for? Like, Come on to Brooks Methodist Church. Amen. <laughs> just don't get hit by a car on the way across the street. Okay. I, pretty soon, if this keeps up, we're going to need some young men with a green and uh, some, some type of orange, nice, fancy vest outside with flags waving people in. Look, you talk about getting the attention of some people. That'll really get it. I joke all the time about locking the door and letting y'all just line up and wrap around the building so as people drive by, they're just looking like, what is going on over there? I may do that next Sunday. I really may. I, just be ready. If it's raining, have your umbrellas. I'll have no mercy on that, that, that standard there, okay? Nonetheless, I have a, a couple things I want to get with you on. Uh, first and foremost, I want to read you a letter. Uh, most of you know that Brother Bill Amberg had died and he has gone to be with the Lord Jesus Christ. Amen. Now, I may not have used the right terminology because those that die in the Lord, the Bible says they sleep. Amen. Waiting for that day of resurrection. We know his spirit's with the Lord. The body has been laid. And soon enough, according to 1 Thessalonians, God's going to come back and take that body up and make it new. And I don't know what that's going to look like, but boy, it just thrills my heart to think that we could be etching ever the closer to the coming of Jesus Christ. Amen. So that's a blessing. But we sent a love offering of $100 to Peggy Amberg, and she sent us this little card back. And I'm going to read you the note on the inside, then she left us a note on the outside. I would venture to say she meant to leave this note on the inside so it would go in that chronological order. So just bear with me here real quick. She says, Dear Pastor and Church family, thank you so much. For the love offering, it was so thoughtful of you. We have so many fond memories of our times at Brooks Baptist Church with many laughs, great physical food, and the tremendous spiritual food. So grateful to God for all the successes that you're having. Love, Miss Peggy. And Sister Peggy is in um, great communication with Brother Joe, uh, Brother Joe, but Brother Love, and he tells her all the time the things that are going on here. I think I sent him a picture of what we had here on Sunday morning, and I'm almost positive you passed that around to about 10 different preachers. So people praying for us say, man, that's a blessing. We need that. On the back side, it says this. She said, I gave the love offering to missions in memory of Bill. So thank you very much. And I had a feeling she was going to do something like that. And I want to thank Sister Tammy and Brother Bart for traveling to be at that funeral. I was unable to do so because of some things going on with real estate, and I felt bad about that. But I thank you all for taking your time away from your schedules to go and hand deliver that and to be a presence on behalf of the church because if it wasn't for somebody like a brother Bill Amberg and a sister Peggy, I don't know where we would be as a church, amen? So I really believe when she says, I rejoice with you, she means that. She gets a little bit of rejoicing in what's going on here, and that's wonderful. Uh, another announcement real quick. May I have uh, sister and, and brother Rundle come up here real quick for me? Y'all stand up here for me? Come on now. This ain't, this ain't a fire drill. They looked at me like, am I in trouble? Oh, yeah, big trouble. Uh, brother and sister 
Rundle have completed the ABCs of Christian growth. So on behalf of the church, we're going to reward you with a certificate of completion for your completion upon the ABCs of Christian growth. Amen. And that's a blessing. And I appreciate your all stewardship of the church to be in that, to be growing, and to be learning for the Lord Jesus Christ. You all keep it up. He's going to bless you greatly. Okay? God bless you. Thank you so much. Boy, we need some more young people to get through some stewardship like that, don't we? They've come a long way. Brother, uh, Brother Nathan is eager to continue to grow and learn. He's reached out to me asking for some one-on-one some -on -one time for study, and, and thank God my schedule's allowed me to be able to do that, and I appreciate that, brother. But uh, I just thank God for the eagerness of young people to learn and grow spiritually. Amen? Listen, I think if a young man reaches out and says, hey, can, can we learn? The answer is it should be yes, absolutely. And we've had to miss a couple of dates for some rearranging with our families, but Nonetheless, I appreciate your zeal on that, brother. I really do. So that's a, that's a great blessing. Uh, another thing I want to let you all know, and, uh, tonight we're going to begin in uh, letter number N. That's the new birth of the ABCs. And just so that you're aware, this, this particular study only goes for about four or five pages. So we're going to do our best to get through this within about one to two services. I'm not going to drag this out, although I could. There's a lot to this and a lot in here. Um, we're going to get through that. And then on w Thursday night, so tomorrow night, we're beginning in letter J. And letter J is the, with Jesus Christ, amen, talking about who Jesus is. So, And that's important because a lot of Bibles nowadays don't really know who Jesus is, amen. They take away his deity. They take away his lordship. And when you take the lordship away from the Lord Jesus Christ, you don't have anything. Yeah. You, you got community meetings with uh, some great motivational speaking. As a matter of fact, I was looking, Sirius XM Radio reached out to me. I had a subscription with them. I'm getting ready to cancel it because it's garbage. Yeah. And uh, I don't know why I got it in the first place. But anyway, nonetheless, I, the Lord dealt with me about it. And I got to let, that's part of that sanctified life. I got to let that thing go. So I called today and uh, they sent me this brochure in the mail. And I was looking through it. And they had their religious section. They had, you know, some things like, like spiritual talk and Billy Graham, which sometimes that Billy Graham stuff can be okay. And, uh, boy, he could really preach the gospel. That man could preach. But you looked at uh, some entertainment, and guess who was part of the entertainment program? Boy, Joe Olstein was over there in the entertainment program. Uh, that's where he belongs, in the entertainment section. I'm serious, you all. I mean, I'm telling you, he's an entertainer. He really is. And I don't know how many people have stormed out of his, his services thinking, man, that guy preached all over me. I don't know if that's happening. Are you, are you following me? I mean, really, you got to think about this. If Sirius XM Radio can figure out where he belongs in the categorization, that God's people should, Amen. So anyway, that's why you have to look through those things, glean through it, and say, I don't need this. It needs to go. So thank God for that. But nonetheless, uh, we've got a couple of things I want to go through in the motion of business tonight. Uh, Brother Willis has uh, something he wants to share with the church. But before we do that, I'm going to go ahead and open up. Do I have a motion to open up for business tonight? I got two. All in favor, raise your right hand. Here we go. Brother Willis, go ahead and come up here real quick, brother, if you will. He reached out to me. Him and Brother Bart went and did something yesterday and reached out to me last night and shared something that was on his heart, and I want him to share it with you, the church. So the church has voted to give me $100 a week for what I do in here. And uh, <laughs> so uh, last week when I was mowing the grass, I, think I, can, I was thinking, I can do a better job than that. So uh, we need a new mower. Yeah. <laughs> So I want to uh, talk to Bart about it the other night, and then we went and looked at a couple more the other day, and uh, we found one, which is amazing, because they're in short supply like everything else. But we did find one that would do the, do the job, and so uh, it's going to be about ten five, I think. It's really about $13,000, but since we're a church, they're giving 18% discount on that. And then if we pay cash, it's another, we save a lot more money, another $2,000. So with that all being said, it's going to be 10,000, 10, 5, 10, 6. And so we were figuring it out. That would be about two years of me being paid. And so I, if I was going, if I had got the money, I would just bought the mower anyway. <laughs> so uh, my suggestion is we go ahead and buy the mower because the church needs a new mower. So, again, his proposition is he's getting paid $100 a week. What he's going to do is we're going to go ahead and purchase the mower if you vote for it tonight, and then we're not going to pay him for two. It'll take two years, about fifth, well, about 104 weeks to pay it off, and we wouldn't pay him anything. He's wanting to take what he's going to be paid and just apply that to a new mower for the future of the church to use it for the grounds here. And Brother, uh, Brother Hayes, a few months back, about six or eight months ago, you'd come up and you said, I think we need a new mower for a church, and 
you were going to bring it up, and God, I think, just kind of suppressed that for a moment. Now we've got a brother saying that we need, a, we need a new mower, and I'm telling you, this guy back here, when he's mowing, he's feeling every bit of it. <laughs> bow, bow. So it'd be good to have something new. Uh, is there any opposition or any questions to that at all? Yes, ma'am. Well, if it goes to back pay, it, we, voted, we voted to have, here, here's what he's wanting to do. He's wanting to take what the church is wanting to give him and just apply it to a brand new mower. So he's not wanting to take any pay from the church and just buy the church something, but we'll just pay it over time. Yes, yes, sir. <laughs> I had a feeling that was coming. I really did. That's what you're, I, I had a feeling that was going to show up. Now, Brother Josh, Brother Levi back there. I, listen, that, I was hoping somebody would say it because I was thinking it too. That seems pretty unanimous in the spirit, amen. So we might as well just go ahead and buy the new mower and just keep paying you, Brother Willis. And if you want to pay the church back, you just put it in. But at, at this point, you're stuck with getting paid. <laughs> you, you, listen, you can get over it. You're not going to argue with me or the church about it tonight. That's settled, amen. I'll, hey, uh, I have a motion on that. I had three or four already. Give me a motion. I got one, two. All in favor, raise your right hand. All right, you've been voted out, Brother Willis. <laughs> notice he didn't vote. You notice he didn't vote. He didn't agree on that. That's okay, amen. We, hey, there we go. We can have a great disagreement in church and be okay with it. Amen. Well, there we go. All right. Boy, that's the laughable disagreement I've ever had in, in, a, in a Baptist church. I'm here to tell you what. Shoo we. All right. One of the things we forgot to do in the business meeting we had during the storm, boy, wasn't that something? That was really something. And I really, I mean this, some people think that we're absolutely crazy, but I know some people that were in the bars while the storm was passing by. You know what I'm saying? Right. And you tell them we're in the church, and they're like, you guys are, yeah, we are a little crazy, amen. We're crazy because we're living a different life than you are, and that's all right. But anyway, one of the things we forgot to vote on, it has to be done every annual year, was my housing allowance. And I have a funny story to tell you all about this before we get started. Um, about, a, about a month ago, I had turned in all my W-2s to my CPA in Campbellsville, and I had informed them about my housing allowance from the church. The year prior, in 2020, it was $25,000, and in 2022, y'all bumped that up at just before the tax season to $40,000. Now, I'm not getting paid that amount. That's just what you all allowed me to write off towards my expenses on my home. Well, they thought you all had paid me that amount. And when I sent my taxes in, my, my, the CPA's assistant called me. She said, is this Joe Weber? I said, yes, ma'am, it is. She said, I want to let you know we got your taxes done. And when they give that little inflation of the voice, though, you're thinking, and? And she said, it looks like you owe about $10,000 to the IRS. I said, well, did they take an IOU? <laughs> it was laughable at first, and I thought, you know what? If this is where you want me, Lord, that's going to be just fine, because I know to, to you, you could just blow this over and it would disappear. So I made another phone call, and I reached back out, and I said, I got a question. I said, did you all calculate that 40000 that I was paid at the church? And they said, yeah. The way that the W-2 was written up, it looked like you received that amount from the church. I said, well, I didn't. So they did an amendment, and I got a refund from the state of $9. Amen. God took care of it. <laughs> you, you, listen, I could have been so worked up over the – and that was right before, you know, some things were getting ready to start happening here in the church. And what I'm, what I'm telling you, church, is it's so easy – to get worked up about this stuff. But you know what God says? What's $10,000 to me? I'll tell you what he says. What's money to me? Yeah. What difference does that make? So you just got to learn to keep those emotions kind of in check and just let God handle it. And he did. And I praise God for that. Amen. So anyway, we need to vote on my housing allowance. You're not going to pay this to me. It's just what I can turn into my tax person at the end of the year and say, this is what I'm writing off towards the expenses of my home. And that will allow me to say, listen, whatever I make from the church, if it's, if it's, if I've got $40,000 in my expenses and you all pay me $40,000, that's non-taxable income the IRS cannot tax me on. So that's a huge break that ministers get, and just about everybody gets that break if you are a minister in a church. So anyway, I'd like to bring that to a vote to keep it at that minimum of $40,000 as of right now. Do I have a motion for that? I've got three or four. All in favor? Thank you, Brother Marty. Raise your right hand. All opposed? I keep forgetting to say opposed. I should have offered Brother Willis that opportunity a minute ago, but I didn't. <laughs> No, he, did, he didn't. He, had, he definitely was. Yes, sir, brother. You oppose? What about raising? No, about raising? <laughs> brother Dave, I tell you what, listen, when it comes time for another raise for me, I'm calling on you, brother. I'm teasing. Thank you, brother Dave. I appreciate that. For now, that's, that's about the max expense that I can write off as I've calculated. So I appreciate that, brother Dave. Your mindset's a blessing, brother. Yeah, that's, 
again, if my, like, let's say my expenses as far as my, my lawn care, uh, furnishings for my home, uh, if I paid somebody to mow my grass, uh, my rent, my mortgage, whatever I'm paying, I can calculate all those charges based on what the document says that the IRS provides to us pastors, what we can write off, and I can send it out and say, this is what I spent this year in my living expenses. And if it applies, if it fits in those categories, they'll tie them to non-taxable incomes. So that's what that essentially is. Churches can pay that to their pastors, but I don't want y'all to pay me an extra $40,000 yet. I'm joking. I'm joking. It's a joke. Okay. Teasing. But uh, Brother Dave, I'm going to call your employer. You need to raise too. We're all going to vote for that here at the church. Okay. God bless you, brother. Now, last but not least, you all, this is my least favorite thing to do in a church, although it does happen sometimes. I, I did mention to you all, we have some members as of right now that are in some situations that we need to be aware of. And one of those is Jasmine Camacho. She was baptized in the church and gave a profession of faith. And I love her very much. However, she got tied back up with some things in the world. And I reached out to her several times to no avail. She wouldn't get back with me. So I've made the attempt to touch base with these people again, and I just implored her. I said, listen, I really need to speak with you. Could we meet? And, of course, I tied that text message. Listen, men, I tied that text message in with my wife. Right. Don't forget that, okay? Anyway, she reached back out, and she said, Brother Joe, if this is involving my membership of the church, just go ahead and vote me out. She said, I'm looking for a church right now. I haven't found one. And I said, well, okay, Jasmine. I said, I would really love to speak with you about this, but if that's your decision, we can do that. She says, yeah, with, she's, she's pregnant right now. She's married. And she said, with my pregnancy, I'm having complications, and I'm sick a lot, and I just don't feel like I'm going to be able to meet you. My, my retort to that was, whenever you feel good, let me know. I'll open my schedule up to you. And she just shut it down. So she doesn't want to meet with me. It doesn't mean I'm not going to run into her every once in a while where she works, if she still works there. But nonetheless, she said, just go ahead and vote me out. And this breaks my heart, but it doesn't mean she's not welcome to come back in here. Listen to me. Listen. I don't mean when she walks through those doors, you all give her a scouring face. I find out about that, you'll be in more trouble with me than you've ever been. You welcome her back, and let's give some restoration where restorations do, amen. How many times have we walked away and doing what we should have been doing for Jesus Christ, and we didn't? He still comes back with open arms, all right? So anyway, um, I'm going to go ahead and open up a vote to have her membership revoked from the churches of right now, and if she ever brings that restoration, we'll give it. i got a motion right here. i got another one. Thank you, brother. Everybody, at that kind of motion, everybody's like, that's good. I'm glad you feel that way. All in favor, raise your right hand. Our clerk, if you go ahead and notate that and put that in the book tonight before we leave. Amen. Outside of that, that's all that I've got as of right now. Um, I need to meet with Aaron and Bonnie Wade, our current members of the church. They have told me that we can meet on Saturday, and I need to have somebody uh, help me with that meeting. If you're available on Saturday at some point in time, please let me know. I'd like to take a, a witness with me to go and visit with them so we can talk to them as well. Outside of that, that's all I've got as far as uh, announcements and motions of business for tonight. Sorry they didn't go the way you wanted to, Brother Willis, but... Amen. That's, that's the Lord's doing. Go ahead and come on up. We'll go ahead and take the tithes and the offerings tonight. Okay, if you would stand once more and turn to page 375. Page 375.
sirens go off during a nader storm too. I'm pretty sure that's what I saw there. Amen. <laughs> Amen. I feel like the Lord did me to sing a special here real quick. So I'm gonna, well, I think I'm going to do an acapella. I think so. Brother Willis, once, or Brother Wade, when I finish singing this song, I'm going to call on you to share that request of prayer that we mentioned that you talked to me about before service tonight. Don't let me forget that after this special. I have a tendency of reminding myself, and then I move right along and forget. So now I've got an accountability partner, okay? <laughs> Lindsay, this church is thrilled about your decision to follow Jesus Christ on this last Sunday. That's the first time I've experienced the service being over and then somebody reaching out to me and saying, hey, there's somebody broken at the altar. Hallelujah. Listen, it doesn't matter. Anytime, anyplace, anywhere, amen. And that was a real blessing. It was a treat to us. And again, as I expressed to you, your life will never be the same. And I think all of us can be moved to emotion yes. when somebody comes to their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ because it takes us back, doesn't it, the day you decided to follow Jesus? Boy, isn't that something? So I'm going to sing this song, and it's a dear song to my heart. I enjoy singing this from time to time. What I want it to do is to take you all back to that moment. And it's a blessing to go back there because whenever Satan tries to tempt you that, oh, you're not saved or you're not living right or... You never really trusted Jesus Christ. You say, no, I can take you back to the place, and I can go there, and I can remind myself. That's when I took my, uh, took my faith and laid it on Jesus Christ. So this, this song is called, I Have Decided to Follow Jesus. <clears throat> I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. Though none go with me, still I will follow. No turning back, no turning back. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. The world behind me, the cross before me. No turning back, no turning back. I have decided to follow Jesus. 
I have decided to follow Jesus. I have decided to follow Jesus. No turning back, no turning back, no turning back, no turning back. Amen. Greatest decision I ever made. Greatest decision I ever made to follow him. I thank God for it. I really do. I don't care what the world has to say about me then, now, or later. I don't care. You don't get it. People are like, well, how do you deal with the criticism? You just deal with it. There's no getting around it. Where stones are going to be thrown and you're going to get hit. I know that. Stephen was hit from a few. Amen. John was beheaded. Jesus Christ was mocked and abused in the streets. You're just going to have to deal with it. And you're going to have to be okay with it. i tell you what helps you be okay with it. The more you grow in Christ Jesus, the easier those persecutions become. When you flake out, you run, and you're no longer underneath the preaching, and you don't grow in Jesus Christ, it don't get much easier, I can tell you. Adults don't like a spanking any more than a baby does, but you learn some things as you grow through it some. You understand what I'm saying? You've got to be able to stick it out and grow through it. Amen. Take your uh, ABCs of Christian growth. I'd like you to turn to page 91, beginning in the new birth. The new birth. Brother Wade, will you share that announcement with everybody tonight, that prayer request that you gave, brother? Thank you. I appreciate that very much. went in the hospital and I, I had a prayer asked for her about a month ago. Yes, sir, I remember. She had a spot of cancer on her one of her lungs. And they took her back to the hospital the other day and it was getting bigger. They put her on medicine and sent her back home. She's on oxygen the whole time. And she was at home when she passed away and he said she didn't suffer. She, she went quick. And I haven't got any details on the barrier or anything yet. I went up and talked to him yesterday and he they got all arrangements made yet. So, so be in prayer for him. As I know yeah. you, you talked to me in the office about how difficult that was for him to lose his wife. Somebody mentioned they'd never seen that man cry before. Yeah. And then they saw him weeping after the loss of his wife. Yeah, his sister told me that's the first time she ever seen, seen him cry. cry. Amen. Well, we'll be praying for him. What was his name again? Ronnie Williams. Y'all pray for Ronnie Williams. The Lord will give him peace. Amen. Y'all continue to keep Brother C.J. Ferguson in your prayers. He was wanting to be here tonight. They actually went and had the tubes in his back removed today. And that was a huge comfort to him. For those of you that weren't aware, when they first had done the surgery, to, they took a, a portion of his small intestines and it connected it from where his bladder used to be to the extremity of his stomach, his abdomen wall. That way some of that, um, that urination could come out of that particular bag there. It was leaking internally, so they put two lines into his kidneys to help with that, and they went and finally removed those today. You all don't understand that he's going through some things right now. And I'm not, I'm not saying you don't understand like you don't know. I'm just saying that he, he is really, him and his wife are really going through it. So just continue to keep them in prayers. He's in pain, and he told me, he said, as much as I want to be there, he said, I'm exhausted. He had his first uh, ke uh, chemotherapy treatment on Monday. So he is, and again, he is very, very tired. So please continue to pray for them. Yes, ma'am. Sister Ashley. This is the young boy that had the t on his neck? Yes. yes. Um, and they are going to do a MRI that was not scheduled. There is, I can't remember what day he said that he is having it. The symptoms he's experiencing is not, he shouldn't be experiencing them with the radiation if he isn't supposed to work with it. Okay. So they're going to do an MRI, and Natalie says that the team of oxygen Okay. Yes, ma'am. They're, they're worried that the radiation... And how old is this young boy again? Seven. Seven years seven. old. Seven. All right. Well, y'all y'all pray for Quincy as well. All right? That's tough. I tell you what. Um, we'll pray for him. Keep us informed, please. Appreciate that, Sister Ashley. Last but not least here, um, I can hear my wife telepathically telling me something right now, so I have to share it with you. <laughs> Honey, if you're watching, I can hear you. Brother Lee Watts is going to be with us for both uh, Sunday school morning and evening service. We're going to be having a meal post the morning service. 
So if you all are uh, prepared for that, just bring a, or if you're, if you're willing to come to that, bring a dish and please feel free to join us. There are going to be quite a few people here on Sunday. As you all know, he's running for Congress. I've not invited him in here because of that, but because of his influence in this area, some people are going to be coming in to listen to him preach, which is a good thing, a good thing. And I'm going to let everybody know out of respect and let all the political conversation take place after the services, okay? We want God to be reverent here, and I know that Brother Lee Watts will be okay with that as well. And then if you have any questions for him, you want to ask him some questions, he's going to be available during our, our meal in between services. But the reason I'm in, somebody says, why are you having him come in? Well, a couple reasons. He's really going through it right now, and he really feels very encouraged when he's around you. Amen. He loves being around you all. I haven't told you this yet, but I, I feel the need to share it with you. He said... If God allows me a seat in Congress, I'm going to move to one of two places. He said, I'm either going to go to Bowling Green. He said, because that's where my family is. He, uh, he, but he told me, he said, if I don't go there and God leads me to Elizabethtown, which is the heart of my district, he said, I'm moving my membership to Brooks Baptist Church. Amen. Okay? So he loves being around you, Brooks. And I'm inviting him in because he's out here trying to do what he feels like God has called him to do. And he needs encouragement from the brethren. And he feels very encouraged when leaving here. This is why God pressed on my heart to have him. Is that okay? Amen? Amen. So I wanted to let you all know that. Wrap your arm around him and let him know you, you give him some encouragement because he, he's taken some sharp darts these last few weeks, okay? Outside of that, take your Bible to John chapter 3, if you will. We want to talk about the new birth, the new birth. Praise God for the new birth, amen? What a quizzical type of, I mean, just the complexity of the question Nicodemus asked. He says, how can a man be born again? Jesus Christ said you must. Listen, when Jesus Christ says verily, for those of you that, that don't know what verily means, what that means is what I'm getting ready to tell you, the next words are the most important words. You better pay attention. So when Jesus Christ is talking, you find him interjectively telling you at one, every once in a while, verily I say unto you. That's when your ears ought to perk up. Not that the red letters don't have some meaning to you, but Jesus Christ himself is letting you in on a preface of conversation. He says, what I'm getting ready to say next is profound. Open up. When he spoke to Nicodemus, he said, verily, verily. I say unto thee. So John chapter 3, if you will, the new birth. At the top of the page of the ABCs of Christian growth, by the way, if you don't have one of these, let me know. I want to get you an ABC book. You want two of them? Amen. They're in my office. I'm going to have one for you. As a matter of fact, Brother Nathan, come here real quick. Lindsay, I'm going to get you one too. I was getting ready to say, let's get her one. Anybody else need one? Here's the key to my office. There's a stash of candy in there. I'll know if you've been in it, okay? That in, uh, underneath the printer, there's a box. Get, get four of those books just in case, four ABC books, okay? Thank you, brother. At the top of this page, on page 91 of the ABCs, I'm going to read some of this, uh, the uh, descriptions here. It says this, There are some precious Bible words we almost hesitate to use these days because they have been abused and misused throughout Christendom. Words like Christian and bishop mean different things to different people, even though the Bible meaning has never changed. Another term to subjected to such abuse is born again. It has been cheapened and downgraded by the world that now we must define terms, what do you mean when you're born again? I know churches that will preach the gospel and never use those words. I know them. I know a man set across from a man that claimed to be saved out of a Catholic church, and I know that you all hear me talk about this a lot, but listen, they're really confused people sometimes. They're a lot like Baptists. But what gets me, I appreciate that, brother. I, I really do. Some, uh, you can't think you got it all figured out now. That's right. Just because you're a Baptist don't mean you got it all figured out. But you sit across from a table from somebody that's of, of that particular Christian movement there, the Catholic Church, so to speak. This man said, hey, how do you know for a fact that you're saved? He said, well, he, and the question was exactly, do you know you're saved? you know you're born again? He says, well, that's a loaded question. He said, well, ask me that question. They don't know what that means. They're confused by that. So as we go on, I want to reiterate something to you. Today, you're supposed to be born again. If you've had some life-changing experience, it, it, used, it is used in popular songs to mean falling in love. Hollywood superstars by the dozen, listen to this, this is true, profess to be born again and yet continue producing their wicked wares. They just go right along as if nothing ever changed in their life doing what they do. I guess they missed the part where you're supposed to repent and forsake all and follow Jesus Christ. Amen. Right. And yet, Roman Catholics and other cults are now using them and using the term born again. Because the Lord Jesus Christ said, 
We cannot get to heaven without being born again. It becomes vitally important that we understand the meaning of this Bible term. You all have got to know. Look, everybody look at me real quick. Look at me. You all have got to know what this means. This is going to be a question you're going to be asked. Because listen, when you talk to somebody about being saved, you need to ask the question, have you been, have you been born again? And when somebody's going to say, what does born again mean? The last thing you want to do is go, <coughs> I don't know. That's not going to do no good in conversation. That's right. Thank you, brother. Give one to this young lady here and then two to the Papa Wells, if you will, please. You need to know it. And I don't want you to think to yourself, well, my pastor knows and I'll give you his phone number. Listen, that's great. And I'm going to do my best raising soon-to-be five kids and pastoring a church and doing all these other things to answer as many calls and text messages as I can. But you'll never underest don't ever underestimate the power of your influence in the moment. Amen. When the Spirit of God's working on that person right then and right there. How do I know that, Brother Joe? Because I'm not going to win everybody to Christ. Right. And there are going to be people, people that you know that I will never be able to win to Jesus Christ. But you can. Amen. You mean that, Brother Joe? Yeah, I mean yeah. that. There are people in your life right now that you can win that I cannot. Right. Now, I'm not saying that I couldn't say some things and help them along in the Bible, but there's going to be a present moment that God's going to ordain for you and that individual, and if you're not prepared to share the gospel of the new birth and to walk them through Scripture, guess what? You're going to fail. And I can tell you something that I heard recently in a message, and I believe this. Aging bears with it lots of pains, doesn't it, Brother Armstrong? There's a lot of pains in the body as you age. But he said, nothing's more painful than the pain of regret. That's right. Nothing hurts worse than that. And I wonder how many of us Christians are going to regret the fact that we weren't prepared to answer some of the simplest questions with Bible verses in the testimony of our witness to somebody that's lost, dying, and going to hell. Think about it. I mean, you've got somebody in front of you that's on the depths of hell and you're ill-prepared to talk to them about the new birth? John chapter 3, if you will. John chapter 3, I want to read to you verse 1 through about verse number 5. And there was a man of the Pharisees named Nicodemus, a ruler of the Jews. The same came to Jesus by night and said unto him, Rabbi, we know that thou art a teacher come from God, for no man can do these miracles that thou doest except God be with him. Isn't it just like an intellectual man when he comes to somebody else to just... Fill him up with a good compliment before he opens up and tries to put him down with whatever words he can consider. That's about the way that it goes now, nowadays especially. And he goes on and says this, Jesus answered and said to him, Verily, verily, listen to what it says, I say unto thee, except a man be born again, he cannot see the kingdom of God. You know what I love about Jesus saying that right there? Nicodemus hadn't had the chance to ask the first question. But you know who knew what he was going to ask? Jesus knew that. This man came to Jesus and is going to give him a compliment, and Jesus is looking into his heart. Think about this. This man is physically in front of God in the flesh, and Jesus is looking straight into his heart. I'm sure he's looking into his eyes, but he's looking at his heart, and he's saying something, and Jesus says, I'm going to tell you something. Unless you be born again, you'll never see it. Amen. I wonder if that took Nicodemus back. I'm going to tell you something. If I come before a man, I had a question on my heart, and he answered it before I could get it out, yeah. the entire conversation for me has radically been changed. Amen. You know, are you following what I'm saying? If I know a man's already read the thoughts of my heart, all of a sudden, uh, everything that I assumed was going to happen in this conversation has just done a, th a complete 360. Amen. Jesus looked into the heart of this man, and he knew what he was going to ask. And look what he says. He says the first words in John chapter 3 are this. Verily, verily, the first two words out of the mouth of Jesus Christ. So here's what I can, I can assume is being done here. He is telling Nicodemus, what question you're going to ask me is so important, I'm going to verily it twice. And the next word you need to pay close attention to, he says, I say unto thee, except a man be born, what? Again, he cannot, what? See the kingdom of God. None of us in here, everybody look at me real quick. None of us, Sister Audrey, not you, not me, not any of us, none of us will ever see the kingdom of God unless we're born again. Amen. It's not possible. How do I know that? Jesus said that. So now your ears ought to be perked up to this because this message is valuably important to every one of us in here. If you're a Christian, whether you're a babe or you are in the meats of the word, you better know this. Be prepared to answer this. Yeah. And be prepared for somebody to ask you about this. And just be ready to open up John chapter 3 and read more than just John 3, 16. Yeah. Amen. Nothing wrong with that scripture. But there's a whole lot more to it than just that one verse. Yeah. That's right. John chapter 3, verse 4 says this, Nicodemus saith unto him, How can a man be born when he is old? Can he enter in a second time into his mother's womb and be born? 
So now he's posed two questions here. He says, how is it possible that an old man could be born? Am I to re-enter into my mother's womb a second time and be born again? He is using, because this man is an intellect. Pharisees were very intelligent men. Right. He's an intellect, smart man, a ruler of the Jews, right. knowing much about the, the, the Bible, the Old Testament at this point. The New Testament had not been yet penned to paper. He's talking about the Old Testament, a rule of the Jews. And his first two questions are, how can a man be born again old? And should he enter into his mother's womb a second time? And what he's saying is that's impossible. Well, Matthew 19, verse 26, with man, this is impossible. With God, all things are what? Possible. Amen. He goes on to, say, to share that later on in some scripture. But John chapter 3, verse 5, Jesus says this, Verily, verily, there he said it again, twice. In a matter of just three scriptures, Jesus Christ says, Verily, it twice. Look what he says. I say unto thee, except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot Look what that word is. You know what that word cannot means? That's an indefinite word, isn't it, Brother Armstrong? Amen. It's indefinite. It means unless you experience this right here and right now. Because to be born in the flesh, we understand, means to be born in the flesh. You get that? Right. You following me? Yeah. We experience that now. He says, but he that is born of the flesh must also be born of the what? The spirit. You can't just be born in the flesh and get it. He says, you cannot unless you've experienced both. Amen. What does that mean? What, what is he saying here? Look at verse number six. That which is born of the flesh is flesh, and that which is born of the Spirit is what? Spirit. Spirit. My Heavenly Father, we love Thee, Lord. I thank Thee for the opportunity to preach this message. I pray that it would penetrate our hearts and that we carry this with us every day that we live as a Christian, as a mantra unto Thee, Father, that we be prepared and ready at all times, any given moment, for those that have a poised question and have asked us the things concerning our heart and the change in our life of the born-again experience, that we be prepared to open up the Bible and be prepared to answer that question, Father, and not be ashamed of it. And Father, I'm not ashamed of your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, regardless of what the world would have me think and believe, regardless of all their wisdom, which is foolishness unto thee, regardless of all the things that they throw in that I feel is totally against this Bible, I believe that every word that's been uttered out of this book is the absolute truth. And I thank you, Father, for that. And I pray you be with me and help me every day of my life. And I pray this message would just really help these people. And I pray the Spirit of God would do what I'm incapable of doing, Father. And I pray you would do that tonight, if it be thy will. In the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. Amen. So the first question here on page 91 is this. What is being born again? What being born again is not? I'm going to tell you what this is not. Because there's a lot of confusion surrounding this scripture. Because Jesus Christ says in verse number 5, he said, Except a man be born of water and of the Spirit, he cannot enter into the kingdom of God. So there is something to do with baptism in here somewhere. No, that's not what that means. Jesus Christ does a really good job of giving you a spiritual apl application to a physical story. He's got this spiritual, he's talking spiritually, and then he turns around and gives you the story behind it. Matthew chapter 3 is a good example of that, of the sowing of the seeds. Nobody can understand it, not even his disciples. He speaks in a parable, giving some spiritual things. He tells a physical story with a spiritual application. And he goes here and he goes in verse number 6 and says, That which is born of the what is what? The flesh. Do, do, do you not know, and I've experienced this four times with my wife having children, that when a child is born, uh, the first, the water must what? Break. And water comes forth and then the child comes. Amen. Jesus Christ says, I'll tell you what the water is. It's the flesh. Amen. And the spirit's something different. So it says here in letter A, the new birth is not. Look at what it not. It is not. It is not baptism. I have never, nor will I ever stand in this baptistry with a converted soul and tell them, this is the moment that thou art saved. This right here guarantees you you're going to heaven. I know people that have been baptized multiple times Amen. and still won't see the kingdom of God. Yeah. Why? Because they missed the one thing. Amen. Are you understand what I'm saying? Because I know a man in the, Bible, so I, I, in the Bible, I can take you to it right now. He was never <coughs> baptized. And I know he went to be with the Lord Jesus Christ in paradise. Amen. I know Abraham wasn't baptized, yet was not the rich man in the Abraham's bosom when the when the, uh, Lazarus in the bosom when the rich man went to hell. Was that not the story that we heard? Amen. I know there were two men that weren't baptized, Elijah and Moses, but they were there on the Mount of Transfiguration in a glorified body with Jesus Christ. They weren't baptized, but they were there. Right. Now, when Jesus Christ instituted the New Testament, the New Covenant. He said it must be for what? Righteousness sake. And we're going to get to that tonight. But your baptism hasn't saved you. Amen. 
No baptism has ever saved anybody. Amen. We got churches nowadays that will walk down the aisles. I'm not kidding you. They'll walk down an aisle, and they'll have somebody in this long white robe, nice robe, and they'll say, would you like to be saved? Are you saved? No, come with me. And they'll pull them up, and they'll take them up here, and they'll go like this. They'll stand right here. <laughs> Sit down. You want to be saved? Boom. Sit on down. They're going to sprinkle some water on you, and they've got you wrapped up believing that you're saved from that moment forward, never having experienced the new birth. And they got people believing. I know, I know somebody from this church that paid $1,000 to have her baby christened just so that she could have peace of mind that her baby was safe. Now, listen, that's a, good, that's a good thought for a mother to have, to want her baby to be safe. Naturally, it's a natural affection to a child. But just because you throw some water on the head does not guarantee that child anything. That's right. Amen. I heard a story earlier that from this week. Somebody said, I want to go and take the Lord Jesus Christ. And the mother leaned over in the church service and said, no, I, I, had, you, I, you know, I had you baptized when you were a baby. He, and, and his answer, this is a special needs kid. This is a special needs kid in a special needs service. I know this for a fact. Looked over and he said, Mama, he said, I, I wasn't conscience for that decision. He said, I, I think it's time I make my own decision. Now that's right. Amen. That's true. Yeah. It's time for you to make that decision. Amen. I'm not going to let somebody get up here and tell me that's salvation. As much as I love my kids, they got to make that decision on their own. Amen. That's their decision. And guess what? It's yours too. And that's why I leave it to everybody that's in this room on Sunday mornings with those evangelical messages. You choose. Because almost the last words in the Bible are, he that will what? Come. You choose. Amen. I don't choose for you. Right. Baptism is something that follows after salvation. Amen. It's Amen. after. After. It's Amen. after. Yeah. Acts 2 is definitive on that. Yeah. It's something you do after you take Jesus Christ. By faith. So those who teach the doctrine of baptismal regeneration, that means that somehow you're, you're saved when you're baptized. That's not right. That's unbiblical. Or the remission, which all infant sprinkling churches or some immersing churches, even some that immerse, like the Church of Christ denomination do, use the following scriptures as proof. These are proofed texts. This right here will prove to you you have to be baptized to be saved. Well, let's look into it. John chapter 3, verse 5. Verily, verily, I say unto you, except a man be born of water and the Spirit, you cannot enter into the kingdom of God. Boom, done. That's it. You've got to be baptized. That's just one verse, and Jesus Christ goes on. And the, hey, Listen, if you know your Bible and somebody were to tell you that, you ever, you ever played that game on, on the phone when somebody calls you about your car warranty or whatever? You ever played that game where you act dumb but you really know what's going on? Is that just me? All right. Well, anyway, you, you, can, you can play the, the ignorant game with people and say, oh, I didn't know that. I didn't know that. Well, but verse 6 says, born of the flesh is flesh and born of the spirit is spirit. And just, just watch that rock somebody. Well, I didn't know you knew that. Huh? Well, well, let's go to 1 Peter, though. 1 Peter 3 says it, right? That's, 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 that's definite. Let me give you some context about this. Born of the water is being born of the flesh. I've already declared that. Born of the spirit is being born of the spirit of God. You know what John said when he was baptizing? You know what he said? I'm going to tell you what he said. He said, I baptize you with water. He says, but they're coming after me. Listen closely to what he says. That I'll baptize you in the spirit and with fire. Amen. You're either going to be baptized in the spirit or by judgment with fire. Yeah. That's, what he's, that's what he means. Yeah. John says, I'm just baptizing. He says, it's just water. He says, one comes after me and this man, that's the baptism you need to worry about. Yeah. What? The spirit. Amen. The baptism of the spirit. And that's a, that's a, that's a given in the scriptures here. So look at Titus chapter 3, verse 5. Here's another one that some other, other denominations will use to try to confuse you or try to make you think that your baptism has sincerely something to do with your salvation. Titus 3, 5. Here we go. It's the exhortations to godly living. Here's one of the things it says in verse number 5. Not by, let's go to verse 4. But after that the kindness and the love of God our Savior toward man appeared, not by works of righteousness which we have done, so the love of God and kindness is shed abroad not for anything that we did, but look what it says, but according to his mercy he saved us by the washing of regeneration and renewing of the Holy Ghost. Well, that makes sense. That's clearly talking about baptism, isn't it? No. No, it's not. Let me give you some context. Revelation chapter number 1 verse 5. Just turn over a few books for me if you will. You've got to let the Bible interpret the Bible, amen. Yeah. It's not up for yeah. private interpretation. You can't make it say what you want to say. That's right. You know what baptism and regeneration is? Easy believism. Oh, baptized, I'm good to go. You wouldn't believe how many churches have members running around in towns fornicating and 
driving up and down the hollers of who knows where, smoking who knows what, sleeping with who knows who, never darken the day, days of a church unless it's for a certain special day. And the church is like, well, we've got thousands of members out here. That's a shame because most of them don't have the first idea of what they're actually should be doing in the sanctified life. Yeah. I heard a man preach on a message called The Missing Miracle. What do you mean, Brother Joe? Think about this. When you're born again, the moment you're saved, you're justified by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what the Bible says. The blood of Jesus Christ shed, ab shed abroad for each and every one of us. When you accept Jesus Christ, he washes you in his blood. Amen. All your past, present, and future sins under the blood. Amen. It's there. Amen. Praise God for that. And then you've got glorification. When you go to be the Lord Jesus Christ, guess what? You're going to be glorified in his image. And thank God for that. Amen. But there's a little piece in there that it seems to be that the world is missing in Christianity. You know what it is? Right. The sanctified life. That's, right. That's the missing miracle today. People claim to be saved, but none, nothing, none of their habitual things change in their life. They're still talking the same talk and walking the same walk and doing the same things over and over. And yet every once in a while I get on Facebook and say, praise God, he's risen. And then after Easter Sunday, they're waking up drunk from the bar from the night before, missing church on Sunday morning. Preach. I mean sincerely. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And they want to throw a big fuss about Easter. You all, I'm, I'm just not big on Easter. I'm just not. And if you are, that's great. I'm not throwing it against you or anything. I like the kids to have fun and whatnot. What I'm saying is the world thinks that is actually the day that Jesus rose again. And that's the only important time to come to church. What a shame. Yeah. Thank you, Western society, for a, just a false, false ho holiday. I can't stand it. Amen. Why aren't we teaching that every Sunday is important anymore? Amen. Ah, well, because it just doesn't go against what we want. Yeah. It's not what we like to do. Preach. Well, shame on us. That's right. My goodness, every Sunday is Resurrection Sunday. Amen. Here we go. Amen. Look over at Revelation chapter 1, verse 5. And from Jesus Christ, who is the faithful witness and the first begotten of the dead and the prince of the kings of the earth, unto him that loved us and washed us from our sins in his own what? Blood. That water ain't cleansed you from nothing. If that's the case, everybody took a shower this morning, you're good to go. It ain't true. Hebrews 9, 22, you know the verse? If you don't, turn there with me real quick. This is one I want you to memorize. I want you to circle this verse when you get there. Look what the Bible says. And almost all things, I circle this in your Bible, commit this to memory. I want you to be aware of where this is at. And almost all things are by the law purged with blood. And without shedding of blood is no what? Remission. Hey, I baptize you as many times as you'd like. You can get in that water and get in that creek and know every crawdad by first and last name. Guess what? You still don't know Jesus Christ Amen. if you haven't truly trusted in him. Amen. Because you, it, we can have all the running water or still water that we want. Without the shedding of blood, there is no remission. Amen. So we can go on and talk about this all day long, but Psalm 51 says the same thing about how Jesus Christ can cleanse us and wash us. You can see Isaiah 1.18 and John 1.7. But this defines the washing as being washed and cleansed by the blood of Jesus Christ. That's what Titus 3.5 is talking about. The Bible's not contradicting on these things, folks. Right. It is what it is. Now, what about 1 Peter 3.21? Let's get there real quick. 1 Peter chapter 3, verse 21. This is a big one for folks because this is pretty clear. This right here is the mantra now. We, this verse is indefinite. This for sure means you've got to be baptized to be saved. We're going to read this. I'm going to explain this to you. I'm going to share a story with you, and I hope it helps. I really do. 1 Peter chapter 3. Let's, read, let's just read verse 18 through 21. For Christ also hath once suffered for sins. Well, that, that makes pretty good sense, doesn't it? And the just for the unjust, that he might bring us to God, being put to death in the flesh, but quickened by the Spirit. Quickened means to be made alive. He was made alive by the Spirit. Again, he was resurrected by the Spirit of God. That's one of the things the Spirit of God performed. Amen. Amen. If you don't remember that, we went over that in letter H, the Holy Ghost. Verse 19, by which also he went and preached unto the spirits in prison. Verse 20, which sometime were disobedient when once the long suffering of God waited in the days of Noah while the ark was a, was a preparing wherein few, that is eight souls, were saved by water. We're talking about the first judgment of the earth. He's talking about Noah in the days of the flood. He's talking about water. Amen. Look what he says in verse 21. The like figure whereunto even baptism doth now also save us. Here's the issue is that when that verse is quoted, that's all they quote, Courtney. They don't go any further than that. 
They'll quote that to you. Say, well, 1 Peter 3.21, that's what it says. You got to read the little print. You know that parentheses means, you, know, you ever taught, taught this in school? This is an extra thought to be added on to what was just said. You got to read this. Look what it says. Not the putting of the way of the filth of the flesh. Guess what? The Bible just declared to you, you being baptized doesn't put the filth of your flesh away. You know, Constantine, the man that started the Catholic Church by marrying paganism, he brought, he bridged the relationship and the marriage, so to speak, of religion and government and brought it all together and thought he was going to conquer the world with it, devised this one question. He asked some of the leaders of this religion at that time. He said, well, if I get baptized now, listen to me, listen. He says, what, is, what happens to my sins that I commit after my baptism? Boy, they rocked their brains for three or two or three days after that trying to figure it out. Nobody had an answer for him. So you know what he said? I don't want to be baptized until the very last moment of my life. How sad to be baptized, take your last breath, and go before the judgment seat. And Jesus Christ says, you missed it. Amen. I know it's what he said. You missed it. Amen. has nothing to do with your baptism. I have a friend of mine, a good friend of mine, that will debate with me sometimes on this. Even in my house, it's interesting. Come up, they come over and want to debate me about baptism saving you. But one day, I finally just had a little bit of enough. And I wasn't rude. I'm not, well, listen, when I say I had enough, I wasn't rude. I was just determined to prove by the scriptures and by common sense. I felt like Thomas Paine there for a minute. Of why baptism doesn't save you. And this person went on and on. And I finally said, let me ask you a question. You're in the middle of a desert. And there's a road you can see that goes six miles this direction, six miles that direction. No civilization in sight. A car is on fire. And a young man or woman is on the, in, in the inside of that car, caught up in flames, getting ready to die. And you run over, you're the only soul around, you run over and you give them the gospel and they put their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ and accomplish Romans 10, 9 and 10. That if thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ and believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. That's what the Bible says about being saved, amen. amen. And the first thing you do is go, I don't have anything to baptize you in. I'm sorry. So you're not really saved. And that person said, no, I believe Jesus Christ can save him right then and there. And I said, so do I. I believe Jesus Christ Amen. can save anybody Amen. anywhere, anytime. Amen. That's what I believe. You don't need water to get that accomplished, folks. That's right. Look what Peter says about what baptism is. Look what it says. He says, but it is an answer of a good conscience toward God by the resurrection of who? Jesus Christ. Amen. Amen. That's what the Bible says. So now we've cleared the air up. And as I have said on multiple occasions, when somebody gets saved, their good conscience will put them in that baptistry and get them baptized to show everybody, I'm following Jesus Christ. Amen. No turning back. Amen. No turning back. Amen. Baptism is a figure. On page number 92, it's a figure. Letter B says, the literal washing of the body does nothing for us spiritually. Nothing. Nothing for you. Nothing about that water redeems, justifies, or consecrates your flesh. Baptism is the answer or the response of a good conscience toward God. How do we get a good conscience in the first place? Well, you just look at Peter 3, 14 through 16. You can read that later. It is not the act of baptism which saves us. It is what baptism pictures that saves us. In other words, the death, burial, and resurrection of who? Jesus Christ. That's what that is. Now, the new birth is not reformation or reformation. How often do people turn over a new leaf? You ever heard that? I tell you what, we've made at the beginning of every year an opportunity for new leaves, haven't we? That's right. Well, I tell you what, all of a sudden the world does a 360 around the sun. Everybody's just got a new... Uh, That's right. Uh, oh, uh, no, nobody here? Uh, you, are you following what I'm saying? You know what they do? When, when the sun comes up on New Year's Eve, i got a New Year's resolution. Here's a, I'm going to turn a new leaf this year. I'm going to put the bo bottle down. I'm going to do it. Turn that camera off back there. Whatever it is, we want to turn a new leaf. Right. People think, oh, I've, 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 I've quit this for Jesus, but I've still got this bag of stuff over here I'm going to hang on to, and I'm doing good. God's pleased with me. He's not pleased with us right. doing that mess. That's not what he's pleased with. You know what he told the young rich ruler? He said, go sell everything you have. Why? And I, I, I failed to mention this on Sunday because most of you are already aware of it. But it's not wrong for you to have a few things. Let me express something to you, though. When your things have you, yeah, right. that's an issue. Yeah. Yeah. Your things shouldn't have you. I was talking to a man over lunch two weeks ago, and I said, you know what's sad? is The Bible says godliness with contentment is great, 
Thank you, brother. I appreciate that. You know, the sad part about it is nowadays, Sister Missy, it seems like the world doesn't have either of those things. And we're in a heaping mess, Sister Leslie. We're in a mess. It used to be we had both, and we can't even claim to have one of them nowadays. Nicodemus had religion. He had religion. And he had a position of authority, and that wasn't enough. And we already, know, we already know that conversation. Jesus told him it wasn't enough. The rich young ruler kept the commandments, or so we thought. That wasn't enough. Saul, who was later converted to Paul, had every outward season or every reason to be accepted by God. You know what Paul said about his life prior to giving it over to the Lord Jesus Christ? He said, I bore a good conscience before God. Think about this. He was persecuting the church of God. He was committing people in chains in prison, both men and women. The Bible says after the first martyr Stephen died, he was consenting over his death. He was there making sure it was happening. I don't know about you, but I always, when you, when you read that picture of Stephen, we think he gets to the corner wherever he's at when they start picking up thrones, uh, stones to throw at him. And you know what's sad is you get this picture image in your mind that Stephen was full there. He was whole in the body. You know what it says before they started stoning that man when he was preaching the gospel? They gnashed their teeth on him. I don't know if he was missing a few fingers. Right. I don't know if he was missing an ear or he had some parts of his flesh with teeth marks in them. Yeah. Nonetheless, he's there bleeding in the street and they pick up stones to stone him. This is no easy thing. And there's Paul making sure it's all going on. That's right. There he is. Yeah. He's making sure it's happening and he's feeling good about it. And then he writes in the book of Philippians, I believe, he says, but I bore a good conscience before God until I got saved. What do you mean? How can a man bear a good conscience doing those things? Because he thought he was honestly zealous for the Lord. He really thought that murdering Christians was God's will for him because he thought that Jesus Christ was a heretic and was a false God until he met Jesus Christ on the road to Damascus saying that he changed his life forever. That's when he got saved. Then he asked the important question, what would that have me to do? Isn't that a great question? Yes, sir. What would you have me to do, Lord? Here we go. The new birth is not some religious experience either. No matter how much of your religious experience you've had, it's not enough. Amen. Let me explain. Many people equate their experience to real salvation. Simon Magnus over in Acts chapter 8, you know the man that was acclaimed for having some sorcery to his name? You know, you know the story? Go to Acts chapter 8, if you will. Is it okay if I preach over tonight? Just a few minutes? Yes, Stick sir. with me here. Stick with me. Acts chapter 8. I won't go much longer. I just want to reiterate a few things to you real quick because this is important to know. Acts chapter 8. I want to look at verse number 9. The Bible says this, But there was a certain man called Simon, which before time in the same city used sorcery to bewitch and bewitch the people of Samaria, giving out that himself was some great one. Now, if you will, also look at verse number 13 and 18 through 22. So verse 13 says this. Then Simon himself believed also, and was, when he was baptized, he continued with Philip and wondered, beholding the miracles and signs which were done. Now, here's the part you need to really pay attention to, verse 18 through 22. And when Simon saw that through laying hands on the apostles' hands by the Holy Ghost was given, he offered them money. So he sees something done that he knows, listen... I think I can buy this miracle off of them because he's a sorcerer. So sorcerers do. You ever seen a magician say, hey, will you sell me your tricks? That's, right. That's what they ask. Yeah. Sell me the trick. What are you doing to trick? He thinks they're tricking people. He says, give me this gift. Look what it goes on to say in verse number 19, saying, give me also this power that on whomsoever I lay hands, I may receive the Holy Ghost. Or he may receive the Holy Ghost. But Peter said unto him, thy money perish with thee. I'm going to tell you something. That's a good friend Peter is. Thank God for Peter and a rebuke there. Yeah. You know, some of us could really do well about taking a good rebuke in love. Amen. We really could. We could do a lot better at it. Because yes, sometimes a, a good rebuke is what we need. I can't tell you how many times I've been rebuked and I thought, man, that was hard. Ow, that hurt. And then I realized later on, no, that person was right. That's that was right. good. Amen. That was good for me. That was Amen. edifying to me. Thank God for a brother that loves me. Amen. Yeah. And it goes on and says this. Because thou hast thought that the gift of God may be purchased with money. Thou hast neither part nor lot in this matter, for thy heart is not right in the sight of God. Repent, therefore, of this thy wickedness, and pray God, if perhaps he thought of thine heart, may be forgiven thee. So, folks, he had an experience. It wasn't enough. You can't just buy the power of God. It's a gift. It's given to us, something that you receive. And Jesus warned about the shallow, experienced, oriented emotionalists 
In Matthew 13, turn there with me if you will. Go to the book of Matthew. Matthew 13. Matthew 13, beginning in verse number 3, the Bible says, And he spake many things unto them in parables, saying, Behold, a sower went forth to sow. Look down at verse number 5 now, Matthew 13, 5. Some fell upon stony places where they had not much earth, and forthwith they sprung up because they had no deepness of earth. Now verse 18, 20, and 21. Verse 18 says, Hear ye therefore the peril of the sower. You know, and when you don't understand something about the Bible, just keep reading. Just keep on reading. God will reveal it to you. He always does. He's a good father. Amen. Amen. He'll let you know. Look what it says over in verse 20. But he that received the seed in stony places, the same as he that heareth the word. And Anon, that word Anon there just means immediately with joy received it. Hey, praise God. I've received it with joy. I'm glad. And then look what happens over in verse 21. Yet hath no root in himself and endureth for a while. Endureth means he lasts for a little while. For when tribulation or persecution ariseth because of the word by... By and by he is offended. So they just disappear. And folks, that's sad, but it happens all the time. Yes, it does. People get this emotional feeling. They're like, man, I, I really experienced something. And then the first time somebody comes along and goes, boom, they're gone. They're out of the church, disappeared. Right. Can't find them. Right. They're in, they're in a, uh, just a, a bomb shelter somewhere, hiding out, waiting for who knows what. Sad. Jesus warned about this. But I'm going to give you some experience. There's a, there's a note, and I want to give you some scripture here. I'm going to finish with this, and then we're going to, We'll touch on the, underneath this train here on this picture here at the bottom of the page next Wednesday. I want to touch on a few things here. I want to get on this note. Look what it says about emotions. Look what it says. Emotions are evoked when we are born again, and many people count their salvation or count their salvation as an experience. The important thing to remember is that the experience is not what saves us. It is something which follows. I, I, I'm going to reiterate this again. This note has some liberty to it. Let me just express something to you. Your salvation comes with emotions, but it's not emotions alone. It is not the emotion of that day that saves you. Now, listen, my day of being saved, I was very emotional. I was weeping over the phone. I was weeping and praising God and thanking God. But listen, those emotions aren't going to carry you very long. It's like the stony ground. The heat's going to come up, and you're going to be dead. Those emotions, I'm telling you, they're going to disappear. And when they disappear, you know what's left? The great witness and foundation of Jesus Christ in your heart. How many of you have been walking through life after salvation, and one day you hit a wall, and you go, pow, whoa! I don't feel like I did yesterday, so I must not be saved today because I don't have the same feeling that I had yesterday. Listen, you're not going to have the same feeling. You know what I tell people when they get saved in this church? One of the two things that I always mention before they leave the day they take the Lord Jesus Christ. Number one, Romans chapter 8, once you're saved, you're always saved. You never escape it. You never forget this day. Number two, this is the day your trials and tribulations begin, and the emotion of this day is not going to carry you through it. But Jesus Christ, like gravity, will pull you through it. Jesus Christ is the gravity of salvation. He will draw you through all those hard and very challenging and difficult times. Let me express to you some times, and emotions have their own play. You've got to be careful with emotions. Emotions are like a fire. Inside of a furnace, emotions are good, and they're used, and they're great. Outside of that, you have chaos. Once that fire gets outside the furnace and gets in the house, the house burns down. You've got to be careful with emotions. We know some sanctions of Christendom or Christianity today or some churches they're all about emotions. That's all they live off of. Right. They come to the church to get emotionally worked up so they hope to feel better about something on Monday. That's right. Yeah. But emotions aren't enough. Right. They're just not. Somebody comes forward and gets, wants to get saved, and they're doing this thing up here, and all of a sudden they say, just dance with me, just dance with me. Woohoo! No, your feet are on the ground, folks. You don't know what's going on. You act like a bunch of monkeys. That's, right. That's what it is. Amen. You're emotionally caught up in some things. Listen, the Bible says in Corinthians, 1 Corinthians 14, 40, Listen, all things in God's house must be done what? Decently and in order. That emotional stuff, you want an emotional play, just turn on MTV. You get all the emotion you want for 24 hours. You don't want emotion in the world. What I'm, what I'm not saying is that it's not that you can't get sometimes emotion about, about the Father, but here's what I'm saying. When your feet come off the ground, about 10 feet, jump as high as you want, brother or sister. Just make sure your feet come back down. Get back down and get grounded again because those emotions are but for a time. Somebody says, Brother Joe, that's unbiblical because the Bible says that, that their heart, even uh, Mary and Salome went to the temple. It says, was our heart not burning inside of us? There was some emotion that was played in that, amen? I know this. There were some stories about some people that got a little bit too emotional, and they got out of control pretty quickly. Let me share something with you real quick about Peter. In John 13, 8, 
Jesus Christ was washing the feet of his disciples. And Peter said something he shouldn't have. John 13. Turn there with me if you will. John got emotional about his Savior and his Lord. Peter had a good way of getting emotional about things, or Peter did. And he said something that he probably shouldn't have said. Look here. It says, And Jesus, in verse number 7, answered and said unto him, What I do thou knowest not now. Let me make sure I'm in the right place here. Yeah. But thou shalt know hereafter. Peter saith unto him, Thou shalt never wash my feet, Jesus. No, you'll never wash my feet. And Jesus answered and said to him, If I wash thee not, thou hast no part with me. You see, if Peter would have done good just to have kept his mouth shut. It would have been all right. And just let Jesus do what he was supposed to do. But he let his emotions get caught up and Jesus had to rebuke him. Now, Matthew 17, he goes up and there's a, there's a Mount of Transfiguration there. And Peter sees what's going on. He says, Lord, let me make you three tabernacles right here. And Jesus comes back down and he says, Peter, you just need to calm down a little bit. <laughs> then in Matthew 16, 23, after he institutes the church, Peter says something and Jesus Christ says, get behind me, Satan. That's right. Peter would have done well to keep his emotions in check. He had an ability not to do that. It was, that was kind of his forte. He'd get emotionally driven and say some things he shouldn't have said. You know how often we do that? You know how often I get carried, like emotionally carried away with things and I say something and I turn around and go, <laughs> good grief, why did I say that? Amen. Do I have a handprint on my forehead now? <laughs> no, I, I, I think to myself, why did I just say that? I would have done well to have poised myself as Jesus Christ did and kept my emotions in check, but yet I let my tongue slip up. I know this in Matthew 26 and verse 33. Turn there with me if you will. I'm going to share this with you. There's something else that Peter said, Matthew 26, 33. Jesus Christ is preparing to go to the cross and die. And he tells Jesus something, and he would have done well to have learned from his mistakes, yet nonetheless he makes this mistake once again. In verse number 33 he says this. Peter answered and said unto him, Though all men shall be offended, of, uh, offended because of thee, yet will I never be offended. He'd have done well to keep his emotions in check because look what Jesus Christ says right after that. Verily, this is important. He says, Listen, Peter, what I'm getting ready to tell you is important. He says, I, I say unto thee that this night before the cock crow twice, you're going to deny me three times. He'd have done well just to let his mouth shut and to go on, but yet nonetheless, Peter got worked up. Now, I'll tell you another story. I remember a time when Martha was all worked up when Jesus Christ was in the house and she's running from one stove to the other, making sure the meal was prepared. Jesus Christ is there and he's teaching. And she's running around getting things prepared and every once in a while her head comes back here and does this thing like that. She's getting upset. Motion's rising up and she says, aren't you going to tell her to come in this kitchen with me? And Jesus says, Martha, Martha. He says, she's taking part of that good work. She let her emotions get caught up, and she rebuked the Lord Jesus Christ. And lovingly, he said, Martha, what I'm telling you is what you're doing is not near important as what she's doing. Leave Mary alone. Because she's taking in the word of God. Amen. Amen. And sometimes we let those emotions get wild up. But I can tell you something about Peter. In Acts chapter 2, we see a different man whose emotions are in check. He's poised, and he begins to preach the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ, to which thousands of souls got saved. Great. What I'm trying to express to you all is this, is that emotions are good. Here's what I, I don't like. And here's something that we need to be aware of. When you come into church and we're all sitting here and the preaching's going on, everybody's looking around like this. Yeah, I'm looking at him. <laughs> Nothing's going on. You know what visitors are doing? Can't wait for this thing to be over, man. That's right. Brother Travis Alltop said this last year when he was here for revival. He said, listen, some, some of these other denominations out here can get a little riled up in their emotions. He says, but one thing I don't want to do is sit through another dead Baptist church service. <laughs> <laughs> That's the truth. You yeah. just got to make sure that those emotions are kept in check. You're not saved by your emotions, but when you get saved, your emotions are going to just rock your world for a few days. But then you got to remember something. I'm not saved by that. That's right. Amen. And that's not the epitome of what God is doing in my life. Amen. Because I'm going to tell you something. When you go into the, the prison bars and you're beaten with stripes and you're singing for the Lord, you got some emotion there too, don't you? But yeah. it's, not, it's not the same as the day you were saved. And out, out of all your sin and no persecution, the house of God, people shaking your hands and hallelujah and hugging you. Boy, it's a good feeling. But then the stripes may come. And you better be able to bear and poise yourself with tremendous emotion so that you can do the work of the Lord. Why? Because when the, when the earth shook and the bars opened up and that jailer come in, 
guess who was poised? It was Paul, wasn't he? And what did he say? He said, let me teach you how to be saved. Amen. Amen. So you need to just be aware of those things, you all. I'm, I'm certainly all right with letting tears flow. I think some preachers would do well to get a little bit more emotional when they preach. Amen. Amen. But you also hear me pray, say, Lord, help me. Because there are times I feel like I'm not going to come out of the tears. Yeah. And you hear me say, Lord, help me. I need you because the, i got to feed these people and I'm emotionally struck right now. So I have to ask God to help me keep my emotions in check. Is this making sense, you all? Amen. This Amen. is. I'm, I'm not... I'm not saying this because I felt like I did any justice to this teaching because I know preachers that could preach this three times over and hammer and, and just really give you all some things. But this is some good stuff. Amen. This is good for you, Christian. This is good for you that you know these things. And praise God for that. Amen. Amen. And I'll tell you, and the reason everybody in here is moved to tears when somebody takes the Lord Jesus Christ is because the emotions of the day that you were saved come back. Amen. And that's a blessing. Brother, if you come. Sister, if you come. I appreciate you letting me preach over tonight. I'm sorry to keep you so long. But I'm not sorry that you enjoyed it. Amen. Amen. And I want you to know something. I love you very, very much. And I want you to know I think God has some massive things planned for this church. If you all aren't aware of that after last Sunday morning. Amen. And listen, I get that a lot of churches are, are seeing people on Easter Sunday. I, I, I understand that. But unlike other churches, I'm just expecting God's going to continue to do it outside of Easter. Praise okay. Amen. And if that's the case, I need you all to have that same vision with me and get excited about this. Amen. I need you, church. Are you, are you here? Are you, are you awake? Are we Amen. sleeping or are we awake? Amen. Because i got a feeling God's going to save some more souls. Amen. Don't Praise you? Yeah. My Heavenly Father, we thank thee, Lord, for the blessing of attendance and for this church. I thank you for the blessing of being able to be here and give this message to these wonderful people. And, Father, I thank you for each and every one of them, for they are, are precious to my heart. And I pray, Lord, that you give them strength and encouragement. I pray that something that was preached on tonight would just be an absolute blessing to them. That as they grow in your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, they've grown tonight in some way, shape, or form. And Father, I pray that it has an impact on the rest of this week, moving into this coming Sunday, when we celebrate your Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, once again. We ask you to watch over this invitation in the name of Jesus Christ, I pray. Amen. God's dealt with you, you come. No. Take your blue book and turn to page 286. 286. opportunity to be in your house and to uh, just have your teaching poured down upon us, Father, I ask that uh, you be with all those that, that need encouragement, all of those that uh, are seeking your word. Father, help us to share this gospel with them, that they might be saved and understand what that means. In Jesus' name, I do pray.